In this talk is based on my short essay, which is in your folders. And I derive what I say not only from reading other people's text, which is recommended if you make a proper choice, but also from a practice. <laughs> And about a practice which was mentioned, my practice in Poland, you have another essay which is in your folders. Now, I do not mind if you interrupt me, especially if anything is unclear. <laughs> this first essay deals with uh, economic freedom <clears throat> and what I call a paradox of it, namely that it is the most very important for the standard of living and also for democracy but it is the most attacked. And before I come to that, let me make some short remarks. Freedom is a very misused concept. <laughs> and there are hundreds of definitions. <clears throat> I would not go into these definitions. I can only say that freedom refers to individuals and to relationships between individuals and other entities. And the one of most important relationship is between individuals and the government or the state. Freedom is a variable, meaning that it can be less or more, so which implies some measurement, even imperfect. And how much <laughs> of freedom do you have depends, of course, on the kind of a state you have or institutional system. By the way, it was Milton Friedman <clears throat> who suggested that we try to measure, albeit imperfectly, differences in various freedoms. And we have the Freedom House, Fraser Institute, doing business. Of course, one has to be very careful with this measurement. One should not use calculus, of course not. <laughs> but large differences in these indexes tell you something about differences in the conditions for people who act. Now, this is about freedom. Now, how do you define and even measure whether in a given system you have less or more freedom? I think very, very simple. You have to look at the list of what is prohibited by the state and call it crimes. Anything, any actions which is threatened with some state sanction. And the longer is the list, the less freedom you have, more or less. So look at the criminal law, administrative law, regulations, and you would know. <laughs> of course, you have to look also at the enforcement and the penalties. And one additional remark would be that under socialism, which I am going to discuss uh, later, there was not only criminal law which reduced freedom, but also the fact that the state was the owner of everything, which meant the state distributed benefits, jobs, allocations, and this distributive machine could punish if you are not obedient, if you are not obedient. So this was additional factor which reduced freedom. <clears throat> uh, we talk about various freedoms, referring to various spheres of life, and very briefly, before I come to economic freedom, let me mention that democracy is also a very misused concept. For example, Putin is speaking about democracy in Russia. He calls it sovereign democracy. No dictator would admit he's not democratic, <laughs> but he gets, gives a special name to his or her democracy. <laughs> people's democracy. We lived under people's democracy in Poland and other socialist countries until 1989. <clears throat> I think uh, democracy was best defined by another prominent Austrian economist, Joseph Schumpeter. Very simply, he said, democracy is a political competition as expressed in a regular and free elections, not just once, not se se regularly, free elections. So this is democracy. And uh, democracies give different results also in the economy depending on the distribution of views in the society. And this brings me later to what I am going to discuss later. What policies you get under democracy depends on the proportions between various pressure groups. So you can't, you usually do not get manna from heaven. 
No, <laughs> our world is not constructed like that. <laughs> you have to fight for better policies. And it is possible. It is very difficult, but it is possible. OK, so democracy is a poli regular political competition. It's expressed in elections. And for this sort of democracy, you need certain other freedoms, which are called civil freedoms, citizens' freedoms, freedom for association, freedom of the media, etc. Elementary civil freedoms, you need it. <clears throat> and they are very important, they are worth fighting for. But one should remember that they are used by different kinds of people for different purposes. The notion of civil rights brings you another notion of civil society. It's def defined in different ways. I mean by that, that you have various groups and various organizations in a society which are different from bu public bureaucracies and from enterprises. So NGOs, foundations, etc., etc. Now you have different views and interests in society. <laughs> so civil society is composed of different orientations. <clears throat> One orientation is just to, not to wait for the government, but to help itself or other people. And this is a very worse part. But you also have a politically oriented uh, organization in a civil society, which could be broadly defined into status one and call it liberal. <clears throat> status one aim, not necessarily knowing it, at making a big state even bigger. In terms which was mentioned, ownership, regulation, fiscal, and macroeconomic status, status, I'm going to discuss it later. And it depends on the relative strengths of the opposing groups. What, we, what policies do we get? And the one important reason I was so happy to come here, that was that I presume you are on the liberal side, which gets, needs to be strengthened in every country. There is no country in the world where the liberal group is too strong. And <laughs> It's always the opposite side, <laughs> which tends to be too strong, and we pay the price. And everybody then pays the price. So remember, civil rights are very important. Civil so gives rights to civil society, but in the civil society, we give different orientations. OK, now economic freedom. I gave a broad definition. It is usually disregarded. Or by various intellectuals, especially by the sociologists, politologists, it is regarded to be of lesser value. So prosaic, why it is fundamental. I would define it broadly as a freedom for any practical action, different from contemplation, which aims at giving you income for various purposes, to finance your family in your life, but also for some other purposes. And this freedom, <coughs> uh, referring to this sort of action, can be divided into freedom of consumption. In 18th century, there were prohibitions on what uh, serfs or peasants could wear, compared to the noblesmen. <laughs> but what matters the most is the freedom in the sphere of production. And it is here that most destructive ideologists have appeared. And they were, unfortunately, pretty effective. <laughs> so freedom of production refers to freedom of contract, which means markets, free markets, and strongly related conceptual uh, private property rights. Freedom of ownership or entry. Private com you may have situation when private property exists as a legal notion, but it's very much limited by regulations. We call it attenuation. So people, you may have cases when you have a fiction, a legal fiction. So you have legal private owners who are deprived of their rights legally. <laughs> like under socials in Poland, there were private owners of housing blocks. But the rents were so limited, they would have to subsidize the lodges. So they were, the, they were legally private owners, <laughs> but in fact, were deprived of their uh, 
of, of their property. Here it's a very important distinction. <clears throat> you may have uh, outright expropriation, which means that you are deprived by your legal title. This is called nationalization. And you may have regulatory expropriation. This notion had been introduced by a prominent US lawyer, Richard, I've got it in, 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 in my, just a second. <clears throat> you, Epstein, Epstein, Epstein. It's a very prominent thinker. <clears throat> and some regulations deprive people of their property, but people, some other people still believe this is their private property. <laughs> okay. So this is more or less about economic freedom, which can differ from a very broad one, as approximated empirically, say, by a liberal system which existed in Britain until the late of 19th century, more or less. Okay. And uh, other systems where freedom is more and more limited. And here I come to what I call the paradox of economic freedom, as this is this. A broad economic freedom is fundamentally important for the improvement in the standard of living of the million of the masses. You can have rich people in every society. Until 19th century, there were elites who were rich, but the masses were very poor. What was produced by capitalism of free market is that not only the elites, but also the 99% of other people started to get better. And against this background, it is paradoxical that exactly this regime has been the most attacked by many intellectuals, as Peter mentioned. Okay, so we know this. How do we know that uh, economic freedom is so fundamentally important? <clears throat> we know it from empirical research. It is not just a priori. There's a lot of research which shows that the larger the reduction in economic freedom, the worse for economic growth, sometimes for stability, and as a result for the standard of living of the millions of the masses. And you have two kinds of a reduction in economic freedom. The most extreme one was called Marxism, which was introduced in practice by Lenin and Stalin, by Maoism. Marx is basically, and Marx is produced a vision of socialism, which was defined as anti-capitalism. I am going to discuss it later, but let me mention, if capitalism was defined by private property, then socialism was defined by what they call social, but in fact it was uh, state ownership. How do you ensure the monopoly of state ownership? by making private ownership a crime. Capitalism was defined by free transactions without the rule of law, which is called market. Socialism was defined by the prohibition. <laughs> and as a result, you have central planning, <clears throat> etc., etc. Now, it's something which belongs to social psychology, or psychology of religion, or quasi-religion. Why such an ideology could have been so powerful? because it has been extremely powerful in 19th century and later. It attracted lots of followers, and not only among the workers, no, some intellectuals. If you look at the leaders, they are not usually the workers. They were the frustrated intellectuals who wanted to have more power to save the world. And they were saving the world <laughs> in an extremely destructive way. So we have a powerful movement. Can you imagine social democracy in Germany in the 19th century have millions of people? And social democracy then proclaimed Marxism, so against capitalism, for prohibitions. It was very powerful. As I said, it belongs to social psychology to explain the powerful appeal of this sort of movement. I could only venture a couple of remarks first. It promised a paradise. You have to promise the paradise to attract people. A paradise was called socialism, but defined in a very unclear way. Second, you have to point out the enemy. And the enemy was bourgeoisie, 
private ownership, etc. And then you have to mobilize powerful emotions. On the one hand, hope. On the other hand, hatred. Hatred and anger. And then you have very strong movement. And this was a strong movement. OK, so it was not because capitalism failed that it was weakened. No, capitalism was very successful. <laughs> But you've got this quasi-religious movement which undermined it. Now, a very brief short, there's no one example of a successful socialism in the world. When I say socialism, I do not mean Sweden, by the way. This is a completely different concept. <laughs> socialism, as originally defined, Marx and his followers meant anti-capitalism. So no private property, no markets, etc. They even wanted to abolish money. Why? For a very simple reason, money produces greed. So if you abolish money, there would be no greed. You get better people. You change. There's no such a thing as a human nature. There's no biology. It's only institutions. You have bad institutions like private property. You have bad people. And you have this sort of nonsenses until today. Nonsenses with powerful emotions can be solved. Very well. OK. So this most extreme deprivation of economic freedom felt miserable everywhere, and I will mention it to tomorrow. But they have there are less extreme forms of reductions in economic free freedom compared to a certain maximum, say, 19th century Britain. Uh, remember, free market is not lawlessness. Free market assumes rule of law, general rules good enforcement of general rules, OK? Now, these less extreme but also harmful uh, reductions in economic freedom can be called interventionism. And I will distinguish four directions or types. First, ownership. State ownership is uh, the very extreme form of intervention. Why? Because if you are an owner, being a bureaucrat or a politician, you have a legal and actual power over the managers of enterprises. You can suggest to them to do this, this, and this. And if you, they disobey, they stop being managers. So this is what we call nomenclatura principle. Party or state officials having the personal power over managers have a power over enterprises. Now, you have enclaves of socialism under capitalism. Like Freddie, Freddie May, F Fannie Mae and Freddie Mae, this enclave of socialism. Legally, it is private, but de facto politicized. It was a transmission belt of political instructions to the economy. Look at the experience of Spain after 2008. What kinds of banks failed more? This is a sort of natural experiment. In Spain, you have two kinds of banks. Politicized, called cajas, regionally politicized banks, and private. Oh, and cajas has failed much more because of political credit allocation. Beautiful aqua parks. Everything which is impressive, <laughs> but sometimes uh, uh, miserable in economic terms. The same story in Germany. You have private and politicized. The politicized are called lender banker, lender banks. And they, most of them have failed. These are, so you have enclaves of socialism, which produce bad results. But what happens next? Capitalism is blamed for the pernicious effect produced by the enclaves of socialism. So as a principle, every enterprise should be private. And if you want to make an exception, the burden of proof should fall on people who want to be an exception. But this should not be just a word strategic. What does it mean strategic? OK, this should be it. Second interval is regulatory, which was mentioned. <coughs> and George Stigler coined a very important regulatory capture. And lots of regulations are due to regulatory capture. Larger enterprises or trade unions want to have certain regulations. And again, there's a lot of empirical research. 
which shows how product regulations or labor market regulations produce bad results in terms of economic growth. And sometimes, let me use the word unfairness. In Spain, Italy, Greece, you have what was called the dual labor market, meaning you had insiders which could not be dismissed because they were heavily protected. And you have other people who could be dismissed from one day to another, younger people. And what happened when you have a recession? And enterprises are under stress. You cannot dismiss insiders. You dismiss younger people, outsiders. And then you had an explosion in unemployment. This is not a result of free markets. It is a result of very bad and opportunistic regulation because politicians are afraid of trade unions. <laughs> Product markets. <clears throat> in Poland, we used to have many professions which were called free professions. I don't know how, like uh, lawyers, uh, tax advisors. Now, what does it mean free? Closed. <laughs> free professions are closed. You cannot enter. This is why it is a special freedom for those who are already inside. <laughs> so, you have a lot of regulations which limit or remove competition. So extremely important motivational force which cannot have, can't have a good substitute. So, and you have a lot of research, for example, OECD research, which shows, again, negative effects of this sort of anti-market or anti-competitive regulation. So this, again, empirical. Until the 80s of 20th century, it was uh, commonly assumed that you have certain natural monopolies, so it's better that natural monopolies are stayed on. And then we have an instance of practical impact of empirical economics. Because some people in the US have shown you, cannot, you can get rid of this, you can introduce competition, and it was done. So not everything is hopeless, you can do it. Okay, so we know from lots of experience that most of regulations bring about privileges but hamper other people and economic growth. Financial regulations, there was a mention of uh, the root causes of financial, recent financial crisis. Not only the recent financial crisis, but previous financial crisis, which are largely brought about by various bad state interventions. If you're interested in that, I think an excellent economist in the US is uh, Charles Kalomiris. He's of Greek origin, as the name. Charles has done a lot of empirical work disclosing uh, these root causes of interventions. Some of them were enclaves of socialists, but also regulatory interventions. Some of these interventions were international. You might have heard about Basel, but committee. So the issue regulations and one of these regulations says that if your banks if a bank in a given country lent to the government it is not risk riskless riskless which encourages banks to lend to the sovereigns until both get bankrupt this is the story of greece among other countries and this nonsensical regulations are still still in force why who issues the regulations the government the conclusion, you have to press government more. That's it. OK, finally, you have a welfare state interventionism. It does not make sense to, I think, in practical action to attack the very notion of the welfare state. But we have a lot of badly structured and expanded, over-expanded welfare states. And this, brought, uh, this is the main reason for the fiscal crisis even before the recent, what is called, global financial crisis. Most countries of, uh, of the West were facing fiscal, huge and growing fiscal problems because of prospects of aging and actual aging. It was clear that the evolution of welfare states is not sustainable. And it became even clearer as a result of policies of fiscal expansion employed by many countries and many governments during this so-called global uh, uh, financial crisis. 
and there are huge distortions produced by some welfare states. Look at Brazil. Brazil have, was never an economic tiger. There's only one economic tiger, I think, in Latin America, which is Chile, now being under attack. <laughs> Brazil was never, lots of statism, and a very expanded welfare state where most benefits go to richer people, to public administration, to the judges. Look at Bangladesh or India. Education is free, but the teachers do not go to teach. So poor farmers are sending their children to private schools and pay for the education. So there's a tragedy of welfare state in uh, developing countries. But there are also depressing stories in some uh, more developed economies. Sweden was mentioned. Sweden, you, if you discuss Sweden, you have to look at the whole history. Sweden was very poor at the end of 19th century and started to grow mostly thanks to liberal policies in the European sense. It was not the big welfare state which produced <laughs> economic growth because it was not existent. No, Sweden followed more or less free market economics, get richer, and only after the Second World War there were some excesses. In the 70s, the banking crisis, which brought about, both of them brought about the uh, collapse of the economy, but then they improved, as Peter has mentioned. That's true that there are some free mar more free markets in Sweden than in the United States. In the US, to my knowledge, the powerful teacher unions block innovations, like voucher system. In Sweden, uh, in a voucher system was introduced, what is more, for profit firms compete for the vouchers. So you have competition. Okay. And finally, uh, you have what I called macroeconomic status or interventionism. One was Keynesianism. And the root belief was that free market economy is not self-stabilizing. So you need some enlightened state intervention. <laughs> so otherwise, it got stuck. You know, there was against empirical knowledge. In 19th century, there was no Fed. There was no large, uh, fiscally large government, and they got out quicker on average than during uh, more enlightened intervention. But it has permitted the economic profession. I fully agree. Most of the economic profession mainstream is a statist, hugely statist. So, and in macroeconomics, what do you have? The dominance of this view that only the state can stabilize an inherently unstable market economy. <clears throat> and a new form of statism, it's what we are witnessing during the last 10, 15 years, especially to, after 2008, a massive monetary intervention, a massive inter very low interest rates and printing money to intervene in various markets without any constraints, completely arbitrary, but, all, but most of the people are applauding. Why? Financial markets want to have high prices. <laughs> most of observers like horror stories and they just machina, etc., etc. And the models they use to justify the state are hopelessly wrong. They do not have any room for wrong consequences, bad consequences of these policies. Well, I have an opportunity from time to time to listen to the explanations of high officials. <laughs> <laughs> and when they approach with questions, for example, from India, well, your policies brought about complications in our economy because they are flooding our economy with cheap money and then there are fluctuations. The standard response is this. No, according to our models, every, everybody benefits. <laughs> the thing is, these models are hopelessly wrong. They remind me the models Oscar Lange was using. You know, this, that's a very fitting name. No classical status. Yes, absolutely. So Oscar Lange constructed the model, very simple one. And according, based on this model, he could show that socialists could work as, as well, at least as well as capitalists. What was the snack? All the complications, weaknesses of socialists was it was assumed away, so you can just could not 
It really compared. The real socialism with this one which was depicted in the model. So we have these four kinds of interventions. <clears throat> now, and in every case, I think you can empirically show there's destruction or harms, or at least you can warn, can warn to the risks. Now, uh, what happens? What are the, um, let me say perhaps, what are the driving, driving forces of this sort of interventions? And I can't come now to say political economy, not economics, political, sociology, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I come back to this simple characterization of civil society. You have status groups, and on the other hand, you have liberal groups. Now, there are two kinds of status groups. The far, first are just lobbyists for pecuniary reasons. They want to get more money or the same money with less effort. In other words, they want privileges. Trade unions, mostly business associations, which when they defend, they branch privileges, sectoral privilege, etc. And they have powerful motivation. Well, they are guided by self-interest. <laughs> But there are the second strand, which I would call the ideological status. You have lots of ideological status. One of them, they which tend to idealize, idealize the markets. So big government is good. Corporations are bad. <laughs> and, uh, and, and demonize, idealize, sorry, idealize the state, the big government, and demonize the markets. And how can you do that by propaganda. And you have to know what sort of propaganda is being used to be able to unmask it. And now I'm speaking as a practitioner. I was dealing with that pretty successfully. So it can be done. <laughs> but you have to know your ideological enemy. They use nice words to say big government is good. So you have to know these dangerous nice words which produce positive emotions. A very dangerous word is social. Because the opposite of social is antisocial. It's very bad. So whatever you call social evokes positive em emotions and can be used as an instrument for promoting socially better results. Common. Many people think in terms of ancient small groups, of hunter-gatherers. So common is good. Individual is bad. <laughs> Etc. Etc. So nice words or hate words. If you want to demonize something, use hate words. <laughs> For example, shock therapy. I remember, you know, I introduced what I called radical approach, very comprehensive therapy. It was called shock therapy. The terms was borrowed from technical economics, but then in enter the public discourse, and shock therapy was used as an epithet. Shock therapy meant bad because people associated shocks with electrical shocks. And this produced very unpleasant sensations. <laughs> Shock therapy. So there are many, so you have to know these hate words, which I use. Then there are certain mental schemes, which give you a biased view, but they are emotionally powerful. And a especially destructive Marx, uh, mental scheme comes from Marxism. And many people speak Marx without knowing they do it. What is this scheme? Very simple and powerful. A capitalistic society consists of two opposing groups. One are the exploiters. Marx called them bourgeois, capitalists, employers. And they exploit. Who they do exploit? Proletariat. <laughs> now the workers. Now, if you believe in this mental scheme, you stop reasoning and observing. You may be very intelligent. Some communists were very intelligent. So it's not a question of IQ. And then what do you do? You always support the trade unions, even if they promote job distracting policies. And we have many people who are brainwashed. Or another primitive mental scheme is to believe that the more complex economy becomes, the more enlightened central coordination it needs. So a complete, co a complete ignorance of this complex system. 
And there are many people who ridicule the notion of invisible hand. And they think they are enlightened, while they are very backward. So you have to know <coughs> this, what sort of status groups exist and what sort of uh, strategies, communication strategies they use. Why? Because if status groups prevail, both pecuniary and ideological, there's no happy end. If they prevail for a long time, then this produces either stagnation or a crisis, a breakdown. By the way, a digression of the crisis. Most people, when they hear the word crisis, they think about capitalism. They've been, been conditioned. Crisis means capitalism. Why? If you define crisis in a broad way as a deeper breakdown in the economy, then you see that the deepest crisis happened in, in the regimes, under the regimes, when there was a heavy concentration of political power and no markets. Why? For a simple reason. You have a heavy concentration of power. Power in such a regimes falls in the hands of psychopaths. And psychopaths tend to have psychopathic policies. Stalin was a psychopath. And he produced a policies of extermination of farmers and pernicious. Mao was a psychopath. 50 million people died because of his policies. Khmer Rouge were psychopaths. So it is the political concentration of political power and not markets who produce the worst catastrophe. Economic catastrophes, which are sometimes associated with genocide. OK, so if status prevails, even in milder forms of various interventions, there are either, as I said, stagnation or crisis. Against this background, it is clear that one has to act. But first, one should assume it is not hopeless. It is not hopeless. Even it is very difficult. The success is not guaranteed, but it's not hopeless. Now, there, there is no magic bullet, of course. It requires a lot of mobilization and of talent and dedication and leadership. But from time to time, it's possible. <laughs> now, very few, very few words. Stagnation is worse than the crisis. Uh, it's more dangerous than the crisis. Why? Right? Because under stagnation is incremental. And the cause of stagnation is pretty often burned by younger people, minorities. So from the point of view of incentives, crisis is better, even though not every crisis produces bet better policies. I am coming to that. But it's extremely important to have liberal groups well organized, very good in good economics, but also in communication and organization. And what should be the goals? <clears throat> First, to the extent possible, one should try to uncall constraints on the state intervention so that state cannot expand further, which is very. Now, regarding fiscal, it's intellectually easier because you can establish some debt breaks some constitutional limits on fiscal. It is not bulletproof, of course not, but it's better than nothing. First, in federal state, one should have non, no bailout clause so that less disciplined region pay the price. By the way, in the United States, to my knowledge, is a non bailout clause in practice regarding the states. In the European Union, we have a non bailout clause in constitution, but not in practice. It has been violated. And this produces a very big problem. Second, how to constrain regulation? It's more difficult than fiscal. Because regulations are disparate. It's about how you, would you control legislators. Here, I don't see any simple inst institution instrument. I can only perhaps mention that to introduce penalties for, extra, for regulatory expropriation so that expropriators would have to pay similarly to legal expropriation. Perhaps it would be, could be one of institutional constraints, but to constrain the legislator, you need general a very watchful and strong liberal groups. 
how to constrain central bankers. That's another very actual <laughs> challenge we can discuss in later. And how to constrain muni municipal ownership. Because socialism, it's not on the central level. It is a municipal level. So there are some challenges, but uh, the <clears throat> response to these challenges, as I said, is to have a very active, professional, dedicated groups. We should do the following thing first, to monitor what the politicians propose at the early stage, watchdogs. And then to unmask. Because usually the bad proposals are coined in a very nice language. So you have to unmask, to show the costs. And there are two, uh, there are two possible effects. Sometimes you can block it, block bad solutions, or promote good solutions. But even if you fail on this account, you educate the public opinion. So that more people would know this is bad, not good. Second, <clears throat> I think one has to be not only good on good economics, but very good on communication. And being good of communication means being on the offensive. Not aggression, but offensive. One can and should take away the high moral ground from the statist. What they do is bad for the poor people. Those who pretend to be Santa Clauses are in a false position. <laughs> You have lots of politicians. By the way, you have to coin new expressions. For example, in Poland, I always almost managed to, to make a Santa Claus. This is a political Santa Claus, something which people repeat. So, then you have to <clears throat> use, one should not only appeal to reason. We should, what we propose should be based on reasoning and empirical research. But then in communication, you should appeal to emotions. And one can appeal to emotions. One can appeal to such values like rule of law, equality of opportunity, as distinct from equality of income, then honest entrepreneurship and hard work. And based on these on other expressions and values, you can be from time to time successful. And finally, you can distinguish in politics two periods. The first one I call extraordinary politics. It is a gift of history. It, it cannot be produced. For example, in Poland, when we got our independence again in 89, then there was a period of euphoria. It was a productive euphoria. You, resistance to difficult changes was less than during normal times. How is the best use of this? To move very fast, but in the correct direction. For that, you have to be prepared. So working on the solutions which will be needed if you have a window of opportunity is very, very important. So not to need to learn on the job, to be ready, and to have a team. During normal politics, which means uh, the extra factors are not present, because euphoria is, has ended, or you make extraordinary politics after the crisis, too. So it becomes clearer that policies, as usual, cannot work. But then you have to fight for the correct interpretation. I give you one example. What is the widespread interpretation regarding the root causes of the present crisis? Markets have failed. And this is, and you know, some people from the economic professions are spreading like Krugman or Stiglitz. By the way, they did not get the Nobel Prizes for what they say now. <laughs> it's completely in conflict or completely by not associated. But people hear, oh, his Nobel laureate, he said, he says, markets have failed. Oh, he must be right. <laughs> so you have to fight for the correct interpretation, which is empirically based. And if you win, in the sense that more people will think, ah, this way interventionism, which brought about the crisis, then you can contribute to better policies. But let me finish that during normal politics, which is the politics of political parties, you have to rely more on the pressure of communication to be very good 
with that. And from time to time, you win. So it is not hopeless. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Yes. When you take a non-compromising provision about the political and economic freedom, you have many political enemies, like you said, political parties. What I'm interested in is how can you incrementally advance towards economic freedom when you when you're in a political, a democratically political system like you did in Poland, do, do you do you because there there is some sort of trade-off. You need the socialists to agree to something, so you should you, you probably need to give them something so they'll agree to the, to uh, I don't know lifting uh, lifting up uh, uh, lowering taxes. Mm -hmm. How do you get them to do it? Because if you say I'm pro liberty and I'm not going to do anything which is not pro. I, I understand your question. Of course, in practical politics, you are usually forced to have some compromises. But compromises which still bring about net benefits. <clears throat> For that, you have to be strong. You need to be strong because you are bargaining. If you are weak, you won't get a productive com compromise. So this brings me to what I said is essential. You strengthen the free, 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 freedom fight. We need more freedom fighters but in a peaceful <laughs> freedom fighters in the society who are organized to fight for freedom in an empirical way and good communicative way. So if you get stronger, you can get a better compromise. I give you examples. You can mobilize the people. You can. I, I, was, I had the reputation of a free marketeer, a liberal. But in 1997, I decided to go into elections in the most industrialized region of Poland, which is Silesia. Not very liberal. <laughs> Lots of miners, <laughs> etc. I never tried to appease the miners. I appealed to some other people. I even show some mines have to be closed, etc. I won elections. I have won elections. And I have won elections with my competitor was a tr trade unionist from Silesia. <laughs> so I'm not saying this is exceptional. I say, this can be done. But the very important is, as I said, to strengthen the liberal orientation. Second, uh, it is not all or nothing. I mean, you cannot usually improve everything. But if you improve something, it also helps. The doses of change have be sufficiently large. For example, you can deregulate product markets but not necessarily at the same time as it's possible to cure the health service, which is in most countries the most socialist. So try to do very difficult things, but not impossible at a given time. And five. Yes. Uh, you mentioned public opinion. Uh, can you give us uh, an example for things that you try to do, things that work better or didn't work, and why? Sorry, could you repeat, please? Regarding the uh, public opinion, if you could uh, give us a few examples of things that you did that worked, that didn't work, and why? Okay, now, uh, I used, try to use this first period of extraordinary politics, which lasted in Poland from September 89 till for about a year, on, year and a half. There was not much resistance because there was no alternative product, program, and there was an economic catastrophe in Poland. So we launched a very massive deregulation or liberalization. Foreign trade, prices, uh, of course, uh, liberalization of the private sector. We have uh, demonopolized the economy. We have broken up all the monopolies, most monopolies, OK? Uh, since uh, in 89, Inflation in Poland, monthly inflation was between 20 and 40 percent a month, like in Israel some years ago. You get Michael Bruno then as a governor, <laughs> a good friend of mine. Uh, well, then we introduced a very tough stabilization, which in fact always means slashing budget deficits so as to reduce the expansion of the monetary base. These were 
most important changes in the first period. We haven't managed and we haven't even tried to reform the inherited welfare state because there were 40 people. I had a team of 40 people. There are some constraints on your processing power. <laughs> But we thought these were the most important problems. When I was for the second time, between 97 and 2000, again in the same position, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance, in the government in charge of the economy, then we have accelerated privatization, especially of the banks. We have increased competences of local government. We introduced some competition in the health service, but this was not a fully market-based reform. I failed in trying to deregulate the labor market in Poland. I tried in the second period, but there was too much resistance. <laughs> and we paid the price because then in Poland, in the late of the 90s, every second graduate from the schools in Europe was in Poland. There was a, there was a demographic dividend, <laughs> which unfortunately was largely wasted because there was not sufficiently speedy or rapid job creation. Please. Do you think that strategy you described now, quickly trying to reform the economy, is the solution everywhere in a similar position, no matter what culture, or would you think about different strategies in different cultures, different countries? Well, what you have to do depends on your initial conditions, like in medicine. Patients have different disease. <laughs> Uh, so the disease which uh, were present at the end of socialists were very comprehensive, so to say. So you needed a very com comprehensive uh, therapy. But say in Ireland, <coughs> not now, but at the late of 80s, they have all the assets and one huge weakness. There was a chronic weakness of public finance, which was sufficient to drag down uh, economic growth. So have they, they have concentrated on curing their public finance and they were re rewarded for the next 15 years with their extraordinary economic growth. So first you have to take the th therapy. I think that though in the, each case it's better to act quickly than slowly. And this is because uh, you can, if you act quickly, then first your opponent don't have enough time to mobilize against you. So this is military strategy. <laughs> and the secondly, if you act quickly, that the result would come quicker. So your, your proponents would see <laughs> that it was worse. So as a general rule, perhaps it is my temperament, but I think it's more than that. <laughs> and fight, in a sense, not, do not be on the defensive. One has to be on the offensive, not in aggressive way, as I said, but remember the high moral ground is free market economic is moral, as Peter said, in application, and also the basic rules. So you defend a good cause. Do not explain yourself why we are believing in free freedom. <laughs> this is a style. <laughs> Peace. Why do you think that uh, the, like the, that socialist policies were able to sort of, or socialist philosophy was able to embrace the moral high ground so quickly, and that it's so difficult to try and convince even people who are free market proponents that they need to take, that we need to take a moral argument. Why does it come not more natural, and maybe why was it lost to uh, this is a big question, I don't have a complete answer, but some suggestions first. They appeal to some powerful emotions which are not very nice ones. As I said, envy, but they do not call it envy. They call it justice. They stretch the concept. As social justice is completely different from a justice. You can infinitely quarrel about what is social justice and whether the social justice was achieved or not. This never-ending fight is a new name for income redistribution. So they are appealing to powerful emotions of envy while using confusing words. Inequality. The basic starting point is to distinguish between inequality of income and inequality of opportunity. 
but they are confusing it or implying on the inequality of income it's what counts. With my students, I always ask, ask them, well, what is the ideal degree of inequality of opportunity? They usually say zero or nothing. Yes, that's correct. This is the modern ideals, meritocracy, etc. Then I ask them, and what is the ideal in degree of inequality of income? Is it zero? <laughs> no. Then what is it? How much? <laughs> and then they're only guesses. <laughs> no, that's arbitrary. You cannot say what is an ideal. You can say that inequality of income which results from equality of opportunity, for example, indirectly, you can say. Or you would be for uh, the riches which are come based on robbery, etc. Uh, but they are completed, so they are using confusion. They are maybe confused themselves. So this is why unmasking this slogan is so important that it can be done. Uh, yes, please. Beyond the, the, the national level, uh, it seems like uh, we, are in a, we are seeing a trend, a global trend of socialism. You see that in South America, but I think you see it. it, it it's more, for a reason, I don't know why that is the question. What, what do you think that explains the, the growing trend of socialism as it was once the liberalism the trend? Well, I don't think it's a growing trend. There are fluctuations. And I would speak, uh, socialism is a, uh, socialism in an original sense of anti-capitalism has ended, fortunately. And this is a big progress. Where do you have socialism in the world? North Korea, Cuba, it's dying. Well, say Venezuela is coming towards this sort of a system. And you have quasi-socialists in some Arab countries which are so dominance of the state. But you don't have socialism in Russia, even though you have, they have a crony, very bad capitalism, but not socialism. So one big positive change has happened. And it, nobody even dreamt in the 80s that Soviet bloc would be finished. Even in 1988, I did not dream that Poland would be free during my lifetime. So this has happened. Then you have fluctuations, but I don't think you have a trend. Privatization has started in the 80s, uh, late 70s and 80s. As we know, Margaret Thatcher was the leader, but the largest privatization has happened in Italy and France. And after Mitterrand, who has nationalized and then privatized again, there are no major nationalizations. So more or less, if you are watchful enough, there would be no open nationalization. This is a progress. As I mentioned, there was a wave of deregulation started in, uh, in the 80s, but the battle is not ended, of course. But it's fluctuating. Uh, you can, uh, there are some examples of uh, reforms of a badly structured welfare state which does not mean that it is finished, but it's much more streamlined. In Sweden, they have reduced uh, the ratio of spending to GDP by 10 percentage points during 15 years. You have some reforms in Canada, I think. You have reforms in Australia and some other countries, in Netherlands, in the Baltics. So there are some, and in every case, if there's these reforms and other reforms, you have a combination of a leader plus which has been strengthening the liberal current in the society. So on fiscal. Now I think uh, sooner or later deeper fiscal reforms would happen. Or there will be a crisis in France or Italy. So we are going to see that. So I think on the whole, if I had to take a trend among fluctuations, <laughs> I would say it is pointing in the correct, not with the sufficient speed, but in the correct interpretation. You have, of course, in the United States, you have going back <laughs> during recent years. <laughs> uh, so this is a, an example. Perhaps one more, you know, in this battle for free economic freedom, the opponents use a hate word. What is the hate word? We call it austerity. 
Austerity is a very bad word by definition. Austerity, they call it. And sometimes they do it in a clever way, saying that austerity or freedom, austerity or growth. So things growth is good, austerity is bad. You have to see this manipulation. It is just fiscal consolidation, fiscal discipline. In this battle in Europe, the word liberal became an invective. What is worse than liberal? On the one word, neoliberal. It's worse than liberal. <laughs> But in practice, whenever there is a problem and they are reformed, I usually point in a liberal direction, less state intervention. If you look at Greece, Portugal, Spain, they are liberal reforms forced by circumstances. So do distinguish between words and reality and unmask this and manipulate, ridicule them. Satire is a very important. Not long speeches. <laughs> Be quick and sharp. Yes. You mentioned that one of, you mentioned that one of the flaws of Marxism is that they see the employers at the end. Yeah. And that that's a simplistic worldview. It seems to me that in capitalist worldviews, the danger is to see the state or the government as the enemy. And it seems to me that that's just as simplistic a view. And so I was wondering, you as a liberal, what do you think the role of government is? Obviously in Poland, the government had too much of a role, so your move was to try to deregulate. But if you had to describe the role of the government as it should be, would it have any role, or would you just get rid of it completely? I remember that what I criticized, based on empirical research, was a state intervention. And state intervention goes beyond what we usually regard as a core functions of the state producing physical security. Now, this, most people do not question that. I do not question that, even though, don't believe that you have a monopoly, you have to have a state monopoly in this field. No. We have 100,000 policemen in Poland, but 200,000 guards. And the same goes for other countries. So this is not a monopoly of the state. I am not saying this should be completely privatized. In the best army in the world, except for Israeli army, in the US army, <laughs> you've got a lot of private sector. And that's only logical, efficient, because you have a lot of ex-officers in the professional army. There's a huge capital, so private sector offers. So you have a core functions in which you could have and should have some private involvement, but the expansion beyond these core functions in most cases, brings about bad results. Again, this is empirical. You can show based on lots of empirical research. And, and this is being driven by, uh, as I said, status groups, either pecuniary or ideological. So discussion is on empirical grounds. <laughs> You talked about different kinds of uh, socialism, and uh, you mentioned the wealth of uh, policy, but uh, you mainly talked about the uh, fiscal policy, the, the government offer and the supply to things like uh, education, uh, wealth, uh, culture, but what about the redistribution of the income through tax system, a more progressive tax system? What about that? Okay. First, let me mention, the word socialist has two different meanings, just to repeat. The original meaning, which is Total statism, no private sector, no markets. And a different meaning, completely different. Some people say, well, Sweden is socialist. What do they mean? Large welfare state. But according to the definition, every country in the West is already socialist. Because everywhere you have large welfare states. <laughs> this is just clarification, conceptual clarification. Regarding fiscal, <clears throat> just an observation. Would you, could you name just one country which suffered because of excessive fiscal discipline? Suffered in terms of longer term economic growth? Your silence, uh, it's typical. There is no such country. <laughs> if countries suffer because of fiscal stance, it is suffered because of excessive deficit, debts, crisis, etc., which shows that in the contemporary system, you have a very strong fiscal bias towards expansion. So this is political economy. 
And this expansion, historically speaking, until recently has been coming 100% for the expansion of fiscal transfer, uh, of uh, welfare transfers. <clears throat> until in many countries, the peak was reached and then either stagnation or reforms. And as I said, there were some reforms. Regarding so uh, ex over-expanded or badly structured welfare state, it's not a plus in terms of economic growth, it's a big drag. Who, uh, in these cases, when there are problems coming from the fiscal side, who pays the price? Richer people usually do not pay the price because they are more knowledgeable what to do with their savings. <laughs> they are poorer people who pay the price. Regarding redistribution, <clears throat> meaning income redistribution, it depends what is your main goal for your country, not on the individual. For countries which are poor, like Poland was in 89, absolutely the main goal was economic growth. So that to get poor people out of poverty. For that, you need a free market system within the rule of law. And you need taxes which would not punish people who get richer thanks to their work. So you do not need progressive taxes. And by the way, flat taxes or proportional taxes have been widely introduced in the former socialist countries, but not in the West. This is why I ask sometimes my uh, Western audience, where is more socialism? In post-socialism or in the West? Point me to the countries which have introduced flat taxes or proportional taxes, and they can't. <laughs> so economic growth, in, especially in poor countries, based on job creation or innovation, private entrepreneurship, is extremely important, especially for poorer people. Yes. I'm interested in your experience with fighting for trade unions. <laughs> so you mentioned Greece and Spain and Portugal and these countries. Okay, I believe that because of rigid labor markets have now an uh, economic decline, which will not, will not find a way out because of trade unions and other organizations that keep young people like us out of the labor market <laughs> and those who already have a job in there. So how do, you, how do you break that down? Well, first on Poland and more generally. Well, in Poland we have Solidarity Movement, which originated in 1980, very surprisingly. Because under socialism or communists there was no place for independent organizations, including trade unions, but they appeared. At, at the peak, they had 10 million people, members. Solidarity then was not a trade union only, almost, it was a movement for change. It could not take a form of a political party because Red Army would merge in. So they took the form of the trade union, but they, as I said, were much more than a trade union. As you might remember, then there was a martial law introduced on the 13th of December 1881, and solidarity was make illegal. We entered the gloomy period of the 80s when there was no light in the tunnel. I haven't seen the light in the tunnel. <laughs> but then, surprisingly, we have the talks at the round table started. This is sort of compromise between the communist government and solidarity movement, which brought about half free elections in June 89 and a total victory for solidarity, and then there was a first non-communist government. Solidarity then continued to be a reform movement, but they did not have a good economic program. They were for various freedoms, civil freedom, political freedom, but fortunately they were susceptible to free market economic program, and this is why I entered the government. Okay, so solidarity was supporting change. Even in between 97 and 2000, I have a coalition. I was the leader of the free market party in Poland. And we make a coalition with a coalition which was built around solidarity trade union. This was a very exotic coalition. Yes, you know, free market party and a coalition around the trade union. But still, we've managed to make some uh, substantial reforms. So, Poland experience is not typical with trade unions. Now, solidarity degenerated. 
this is not anymore the movement for change. They defend the declining industries like mining. More broadly, there were systems, I think, that those when uh, trade unions are uh, in, in fact a part of the economic uh, political system and they dictate of largely influence policies. And there's no simple rule for abolishing this. You have just to mobilize other forces in the society. And if you do, from time to time, it's, you can be successful. <laughs> yes? Um, this, it, it seems to me that a lot of countries that have more of a, that believe more in socialism goes to the liberal kind of way only when there is a, a crisis, like Spain, like, um, like Greece, as you said. Why is it? Why is it that they don't learn from the past, they don't see it before? How is it that only when there is a crisis they go to the liberal way and then most of them go back to socialism? Well, as I said, there are fluctuations. <clears throat> But I think the worst cases of status are in Latin America. We have a widespread state intervention, an expanded welfare state, lot of regulations, and then these countries are stuck at a very low rate of growth. Like I mentioned Brazil, even worse cases of Argentina, the world record in crisis. <laughs> uh, and then one has to look to their history and I think, for example, if you take uh, the example of Argentina, <clears throat> there was, I think, one period when the populist myth was created under Perón. Argentina then benefited from a very good uh, terms of trade. It was during Second World War and later. So it was very easy to give lots of benefits to the poorer people. And they, he did. He was aided by Eva Perón. Evita, <laughs> so another myth. <laughs> and then this myth, I think to some extent, has uh, infiltrated or created a movement for beneficiaries. Uh, as a result, even those who are against the original orientation of Peron are Peronists, like Menem. He tried to be, he came from within the Peronist movement. And then he tried to establish free market reforms. I don't have a general explanation. To, this is a very important question. Why in some countries you have uh, a stronger status orientation than in some other countries. But in every case, there's only one proposal. Get stronger on the free market side. <laughs> do not, <laughs> do not de de deplore the situation. Get stronger. Yes, I think it was related obviously yes. to the, pro the question about the trend, and I think it was not correctly phrased. And uh, what she said, please, I please. think it put it in place. It's not that about uh, a trend of socialism, or it's about the use of populism. So it's the use to get the votes, and then when you get in trouble, you get the way to, by, to the, by the liberal way. And it's, it's uh, probably the, the, the question is. How, um, now I, I see that, as you just mentioned about South America, and that it's in fact happening. I mean, it's a trend of populism. And um, how, um, that it always sells well. It sells pretty well. I mean, uh, it sells well in elections. And uh, I mean, how come, probably after this uh, last crisis, the big crisis, probably is the answer why, as you said, the markets is, is, are guilty of the crisis. <coughs> and, I was thinking that probably the, the reason that the selling argument, the, uh, socialist selling argument, the populism, uh, uh, probably explains what, what you just said and uh, what I asked before. I mean, the, that I was seeing, I had the wrong impression that, uh, about a trend, but as, as a um, global, like, uh, I start, you start to, to hear global, like, uh, populism, uh, Probably not only in South America, as you mentioned, in the United States too, uh, it happens too. And uh, how do you fight not socialism but populism? Well, we are now speaking about concepts. <clears throat> so let me just remind you: socialism—it's best to be defined in the original way. 
as it existed, in fact, in the former Soviet Union. Then you have various combination of interventions, <coughs> which, as I said, empirically speaking, tend to bring about bad results. And populism may be a propaganda to promote various kinds of interventions, a sort of propaganda. But this is just conceptual. <laughs> And, you know, there's only one way to beat propaganda, to have more effective propaganda. Yes. And what is the, the, the instrument that you use? Because it's very, it's very hard to fight that, that propaganda that promised so many things so fast. Well, this is, you know, there are some guidelines, but then there's more art than science. I try to convey some suggestions, you know, to organize, to be very professional in communication, to be empirical as far as your diagnosis and proposes are concerned, but then the whole value added is a communication in which you have to appeal to good emotions. And you have to be on the, the offensive unmasking these false claims, false claims of, of uh, status. Yes, please. Um, I want to ask you about market size, because we, we're talking about monopolies and I think I keep, I keep coming back to the Israeli market where you have so few people, unlike Poland, which is what, like five or six times the size of Israel. And in Israel, in you get a company. Power. I'm sorry? You just calculate. In terms of population, we yes, have 38 yes, million. 38, so five, more, almost five times. Okay, so in Israel, you, you can have a company which, you know, in, in Israel is not, it becomes a very big company very quickly and it exerts a huge force on the economy and on the market and it can prevent, easily prevent other companies from coming in. And the, we saw it recently in the communications market where when nobody intervened there were three companies and then by the time the government pick up on it, picked up on it, what they actually did was just say, okay, this market isn't working properly so we're going to let the new companies use the uh, infrastructure of the old companies and by that enabling all this competition to happen, but you can't do that in all fields. And then in, in, the com in a society like Israel, in a market like Israel, which is so much smaller, how do you, how do you prevent monopolies without regulations and interventions from the government? Because they just form out of nowhere, because that, that, it's just so small. Am I not? I'm well, not my <coughs> impression is that most monopolies are created by state intervention, yeah. and they are not a natural product of free markets. So if this is the case, watch the governments. So actually at the beginning it wasn't a private monopole, natural or not natural, it was actually a public monopole and the only person the only company who could give telecom service for a telephone. And then they say, okay, we're going to introduce a small competition, we're going to let Orange and Telecom come on the market. And then, yes, you had this mini market, so you went from a public monopole to basically the protected cartel of three companies. Mm -hmm. And then that's when they did open the market. But the, the sequence is not that we started with the market and there was a bad mm -hmm. monopole, it was actually the opposite. We started with the public monopole and we arrived to so, and if you look at a lot of the sectors in Israel where you actually have at the end some kind of market, you, it, most of the time it did start with the public monopole, but there was regulation that were made in order to break the public monopole. So that's not the kind of regulation that we're talking about. We're talking about regulation that will actually protect the public monopole. For example, now what's happening with the port? I mean, uh, you know, we have a big issue here, which is privatized the port and they send some decision and I think the government has been trying to do that for what? Yes, 20 years, we are shipping for 20 years or 15 years, but we are talking about privatizing the port and so on. And, you know, we head to end the unions and nothing is happening. So, yeah, you're going to need regulation there to break up, you know, monopoly of ports, but it's not because originally the port came from you know, a private company and decided to take the country. So it's just that, you know, they were born from the East and food from the Labour Party that gave them all the rights to shipment. Mm. The same as this. And that was the only shipping company in Israel. 
But it's very unique regulation to walk with the street. So that, I don't think that's the same thing as you know, the, the other way around. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Other remarks or questions? Please. Why did you distinguish between socialism of regulation and socialism of um, a welfare state? It seems to me that they're almost the same thing. It really doesn't matter if you're regulating or if you're taking people's money away to then hand that to you want to hand that to I, I wasn't sure why you just said No, this is completely different thing. For the sake of clarity. Uh, to avoid confusion, so for the sake of clarity, it's good to remember that the original meaning of socialism was uh, prohibition of private ownership and of markets, which gave rise to state monopolies and central planning. This is very different in effect from a, in a country where you have private ownership, even imperfect, and then you have a welfare state. I'm not saying that large welfare state is good in its consequences, but uh, it is nothing comparable to the life under socialism. Really. But doesn't it stimulate growth? No, doesn't it stimulate growth and the economy in a similar way? No, it's completely different because you have completely different systems. Once again, can you imagine if all enterprises in Israel were state-owned? and markets transactions were prohibited. This was the essence of socialism. Then, and this is empirical, I'm going to discuss it tomorrow, <clears throat> every country which has such a system is lagging in economic growth for pretty well understood reasons. And countries which have private economy but welfare states have different trajectories, but on the minority, has suffered a very slow, of course you can mismanage. You can mismanage in democracy even if you have capitalism. This is why we, have, we are speaking about different kinds of capitalism. But I, I'm not quite sure and, uh, I, I, and I responded to your question, so perhaps during the break, okay? Yes, <laughs> and here. Okay, okay. You mentioned before the challenge how to constrain the central bank government. Okay, this is. I'm wondering how uh, countries like Greece, the challenge is saying currently, like Germany, can actually deal with the same challenge like Poland that has a different currency. Like in Poland, you actually can control central banks because you've got the Polish body, but Greece can't really control the euro. So. Do you believe that sharing the same currency is increased or decreased the economic freedom? This is again, I think it is neutral regarding this. You know, differences in rate of exchange should not be regarded as being liberal or non liberal. Remember, gold standard? This was a part of a very liberal period as long as it was respected because it constrained, as long as it was respected, the interventionism of including fiscal expansion. Your question referred whether what is better, to be able to devalue openly or to go for so-called internal devaluation. Depends on, uh, on the country. And there are some good examples of internal devaluation, like for example, the Baltics, who have currency boards related to Euro. The Baltics like, uh, 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 like Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, also Bulgaria outside the Baltics, they did not devalue. They have a huge uh, boom, housing boom, which collapsed. They did not devalue, the, they stick to their monetary regime, introduce fiscal consolidation, very drastic way and they relaxed the constraints on the labor market, they recovered very quickly. In Greece, because of that composition of the program, uh, to be more specific, they increased taxes first and delayed cuts in expenditures, and even more they delayed uh, structural reforms, including privatization, they suffered. Uh, they have suffered because of these policies mostly, and not because of the lack of devaluation, open devaluation. There's a huge debate on it. <laughs> I 
ask him one more question. Yes, yes. this time. Mm -hmm. You spoke about fighting the other side, uh, the more socialist parties, and the one more to intervene more in the economy. But fight only on the economic plane, not, not how can you win consistently if you don't have the education side? I mean, I, w I was taught something like that. But how good is so? Not directly, but socialism, socialism is good. I mean, the weak should be with the, with the strong, together, not and go with the weak. How can you win? How can you explain things like that to people that were taught or were taught uh, 18 years that? I hope it's not that bad here that you've been brainwashed all the time, only some of the time, not all the time. <laughs> you need some shock therapy. <laughs> uh, but uh, you have to, what, uh, what I've been trying to do in Poland and other countries, you have to try to link problems which appear to their status roots. For example, if they are mining, like in Poland, well, they are making losses, mines, and then other people via the budget pay for it, you have to explain why. Why? Because they stay ownership. So use events for the lessons. Use events. Try to link in an empirical way. This has to be truthful. Problems to their root causes. And usually they are bad state intervention or delay of reforms and do it very quickly, very convincingly, very strongly. This is a good education. And educate the teachers, by the way. <laughs> Thank you.